What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. I am super excited about this episode with George St. Pierre, and I am also super excited about the animal-based gathering that is happening right here in Santa Teresa, Costa Rica, July 23rd to 26th. If you're not aware of this, shoot us an email at Heart and Soil Radical Health at heartandsoil.co. We'll send you the information and maybe you'll join us for the first ever animal based gathering in Costa Rica. As you guys heard me talk about in the past, I find so much of the life here in Costa Rica to be conducive to living my version of the remembering, getting closer to being a human that lives outside in the sun in community with people. There is an ethos here that is called Pura Vida, which is really pure life, simple life, clean life. And the people here live it. It's not just a phrase. And so I'm excited to share this space with many of you in the animal-based community. And I'm excited to share many meals with you. Of course, we will have organs. We will definitely have some desiccated organ supplements from Heart and Soil. As you know, all of these things are very near and dear to my heart. So if you're not aware of what I do with Heart and Soil, this is my desiccated organ supplement company. We make grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised supplements, which we then conveniently freeze dry at a low temperature and encapsulate, put in a capsule so that it's so easy for you to get these organs in your life. You guys have heard me talk about the benefits of organs, everything from liver to heart, to spleen, to kidney, to pancreas, to got a testicle supplement coming out later this month. You can go to our website, heartandsoil.co to sign up, to be the first to be notified when whole package comes out. But there are so many benefits to eating all of the organs from an animal. George definitely mentions in this podcast that he feels better eating organs and he's going to do this moving forward in his life. We forget about it. It's more than just liver. Even though I talk about liver a lot, it's a very nutrient-rich organ. There are so many benefits to heart and all the other organs, which is why we really want to make it easy for you to eat nose to tail if you don't want to eat the fresh organs. And this is why we do what we do at Heart and Soil. I've been super excited about our lifeblood supplement recently. This one is spleen and liver and actual whole blood desiccated into a capsule. I hear from people all the time that this supplement really levels up their performance and they feel so much better with it. And I really believe that all of our supplements will be massively beneficial for so many of you, which is why we do what we do. Check out this review from uh, Maxwell S. The title is Rambo Time, the best supplement I've tried yet. I've been a huge supporter of Dr. Paul and the Heart and Soil team over the past year. I followed Paul's podcast for a few years. Last summer, I decided to improve my overall metabolic health to ensure I was healthy as I could possibly be no matter what um, potential pandemic the world faced. It was Rambo time. So I experimented with a carnivore diet, began purchasing Heart and Soil supplements. I've tried beef organs and bone marrow and liver a number of times and now have been taking Heart of the Warrior for the past several months. With the other two, I noticed improvements in strength, recovery time, overall energy, mood, stamina, and libido. However, with Heart of the Warrior, as its name suggests, I felt even stronger and appeared to develop strength and muscle faster, possibly due to the creatine and beef heart. Awesome supplements, awesome team, awesome community. Keep up the incredible work. Hoping to um, keep these in my stack long-term. So this is why we do what we do. I always say that it's come from, from the heart. This is how we help you guys reclaim your birthright to radical health. And I hope to see many of you guys in Santa Teresa for the animal-based gathering. If you're not here, you'll get lots of video. It'll be amazing. As I mentioned earlier, my guest on this week's podcast is none other than George St. Pierre, uh, widely regarded as one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. He's a Canadian former professional mixed martial artist. Uh, he's a two-division champion in the UFC. He won titles in both the welterweight and middleweight divisions. He had a, a very long run, um, over 2,204 days, uh, where he defended his title nine consecutive times. He held the title for the most wins and title bouts and the second longest combined title streak in UFC history. He's an incredible individual and uh, was often ranked the number one pound for pound fighter in the world. So I was really excited when he reached out to me with curiosity about carnivore diet, an animal-based diet. And over the month of May, if you follow me on social media, you got to see that he did this for the month of May. And then I'm grateful that he came on the podcast and talked about his experiences. We also talk about all kinds of things, his love of science fiction, Star Wars, aliens, uh, 
where he thinks he's going to go next, acting, and the world in general. So enjoy this podcast with George St. Pierre. And I hope that his experiences with an animal-based diet will be valuable to many of you. If you like this podcast, please leave me a review wherever you listen to podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts. If you listen there, leave me a review. It helps me reach so many more people. All right, on to the podcast with George St. Pierre. Enjoy this one. Love you all. Stay radical. George St. Pierre, thank you for coming on the podcast, my friend. It's real. It's a true honor, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, man, man. the pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me. So I, I, I have a question for you as we start. Uh, I want to screen share. Uh, you've been doing this animal-based diet for a month and you posted this. <laughs> so tell me about this My Little Pony cake, George, because I thought the comments were hilarious. What happened here? Is this, is this your cake or is this one of your daughter's cakes? Like we have to start no. with the My Little Pony cake. A, a friend, a, 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 one of my friend, his daughter had a, had a birthday and I'm, I'm the godfather. So I went, I went to, his, to her birthday and um, when it was time to eat the cake, everybody had a piece of cake, of the cake and I couldn't have it. So uh, I, I, I stayed strong and I, and I, and I resisted. <laughs> Amazing. Well done. Well done. Because so, I mean, there's so many things that I'm excited to talk to you about on this podcast and an animal based diet and your experiences is just one of them. But I thought it was so funny that you posted this, this amazing My Little Pony cake that you've avoided. And so tell me about it. I mean, how has the last month been for you eating this way? We had some conversation at the beginning of the month and you were saying that during your MMA career, you didn't really you didn't really think about your diet. So what's it been like this past month? Well, what I can tell you is the first time of my life that I uh, that I do this. Um, I, I was on another diet when I was getting to f- ready to fight Michael Bisping, but it was very different. It was I was uh, overfeeding myself. It, it didn't do me any good, but I, I was always curious to try a carnivore, an animal based diet. It's not an exclusive kind of carnivore, but an animal based diet because I believe. I'm, I'm fascinated and I, and I, since I'm young, I read a lot about paleontology and, and the study of past organism and priest, how hunter-gatherer used to live back in the day. And, and I think that's the closest thing uh, that, uh, that we're used to eat. Uh, in the modern era, now we, we eat a lot of processed food, but I, I was wondering what this could do to my body. So I decided to, to give it a try for a month. And I'm, I'm so glad you did. And I saw that you posted, I want to show this photo at the beginning of the podcast too, because you, you posted a photo of yourself. Was, was this photo taken? This is a recent photo because you're fucking shredded, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, did, um, I did, a, a, a photo, a bunch of photo photos with a friend of mine. And I, I you know, this diet, what it did to me, it made me shred a lot. And um, what I can tell you is that I, I lose weight, but I just feel I feel just as strong and I'm more lean. And I don't think I've ever been lean like this in my entire life. So I wanted to do some pictures, you know, because you take advantage of it. You look good when you're, you, you do this. So I wanted to take advantage of it. Even I just turned 40 years old. I wanted to to showcase that even at 40, there is still hope. <laughs> Totally true. Happy birthday. And and you and I were talking over this past month of May when you had your 40th birthday and you didn't have any cake. I was joking with you that you could have had, a, did you have a ribeye, a special birthday ribeye? Yeah, I, I had a Wagyu ribeye, but um, not the day of my birthday because I, I didn't remember what I had the day of my birthday. I think I had some lamb and, you know, stuff like that, but I, I, uh, I didn't have cake. I received a couple of cake as a present, but I was not able to eat it, unfortunately. So I gave it away to some of my family and friends. But uh, look, I, I, to tell you the truth, I, I have learned a lot uh, from that. Uh, I also had um, I had an issues with one of my one of my big toes. I use I think I had arthritis in my big toes. I, I feel sometimes, especially when I'm laying down on my bed because I'm more aware of my, uh, of my old body. 
when you, you you're doing sports sometimes you, you know the adrenaline you, you don't pay attention to it but especially when there's times that i'm more very relaxed i'm more aware of myself i noticed that my big toes always bothers bothered me and a few weeks in that diet i don't know if it's a coincidence or not I, it, the pain disappeared. I feel like a lot of my inflammation disappeared. And this is a very good thing because, uh, you know, like an inflammation, we know is, like, is the cause of many problems. Yeah, you mentioned that to me early on when we were talking throughout the month that you felt like you had less inflammation and you kind of lost water weight. Yeah. And I've heard that story so many times, George, which is so cool. People will say, oh, I have this, this old tennis injury in my elbow. And it's yeah. gone away. Isn't that, it's so cool to think that just changing the quality of our food can yeah. relieve these arthritis or inflammation issues. It's incredible. Uh, another thing too that I notice is that normally we all go to the bathroom, you know, like everybody has to evacuate the, 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 the stuff out of their body. The, the, I noticed that I still go to the bathroom, but there is a lot less that comes out. It feels to me that uh, there's a lot less waste that need to come out. Uh, like, like, uh, uh, and, and yeah, it's still, some stuff still comes out when I go to the bathroom, but it, it's, there's a lot less. Uh, it feels like my body absorb more of the stuff that I eat because there's a lot less uh, crap. You know, I've been eating more, more healthy. And this is one thing that I really notice. And, and for someone who has uh, perhaps uh, problems with, with their gut, I think it could be a good thing. Could could be something that helped them. Now, you've been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in the past, right? Yes, I did. Yes. I, I uh, However, I, I didn't have any symptoms for a while as, because I've started intermittent fasting, but I... Um, I, I noticed that if someone has issues, even though they 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 do they are on medication and do they do an intermittent fasting, that that type of diet could be something that they should try on, perhaps to to see how they it make them feel. Could help. Are you taking any medications for your ulcerative colitis now, or is that something you were able to stop in the past? I'm off medication, and I to tell you the truth, I'm, I I think. The doctor told me that you got that condition for the rest of your life, but I'm very curious to see if, if it's still there because I, I do not. In the beginning, I used to feel sometimes some some cramp. Like I knew that it was still there, but it's been a while that I haven't feel anything. That like even when I eat uh, before I saw my diet, I was eating ice cream and stuff like that. Even drinking, I I, I never had any problems. It's been a while. So I'm curious, I should go do another exam, see how this, things, uh, this thing is right now. So, Yeah, there are many people that I've worked with and heard from who have both Crohn's or ulcerative colitis who have found improvements when they make dietary changes, either to a, a carnivore diet of just meat and organs or an animal-based diet like you did with meat and organs and fruit and stuff. And, you know, you and I talked a little bit about Gordon Ryan, this preeminent, you know, grappler, and I know he's having some gut issues too. And so hopefully, um, you know, he'll hear this podcast or, you know, I think that people with these GI issues should, should know that there are dietary things that could be very powerful for them. It's awesome to hear that, that it certainly, that yours got so much better with intermittent fasting, but that also that you've been feeling good with your poops on this diet too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel great. Uh, it's definitely, I mean, everybody is different, you know, everybody, I guess, react differently to different kinds of diet. But for me, if I would get ready for a comp for a competition, it's definitely something that I would put myself on, uh, because it, it make me shred, make me more lean, less inflammation. And I, I just feel just as strong and it make me make you look good. And I, I'm a strong believer in, uh, in, in that if you if you think you feel good you you, you it, it make you if you think you look good and make you feel good then you do good so it, it has a lot to do with the emotion as well how you feel inside inside and it, it, it can have a, an effect on your performance 
Absolutely. You know, I, um, I reposted the photo of you on my Instagram today and somebody commented, man, like George looks better than 75% of the active, you know, UFC roster, like, you know, <laughs> when they're in between fights. And I know you, you're still training. You're a, you're a lifelong martial artist. So how did you feel over the last month when you were eating this way in your training? I know you've been, you know, training some martial arts as much as you can in Canada. How did that feel? It feels great. Uh, you know, like, one thing I feel that when you don't eat processed food, sometime after a training, you'll feel like, for example, um, tendonitis and stuff like that. Little injuries, that nagging injury that can come, come, come back on, you know, like, like because of the inflammation. And I didn't feel that way during the, my diet, you know. And I'm, a, I'm someone that loves, nor, normally I love to eat a lot of sugar, fast food, and I don't eat very well. What I think saved me is the fact that I'm training really hard and the fact that I'm doing uh, time-restricted eating and, and, and prolonged fasting. But I, I do feel the difference in, in terms of recuperation and in terms that after a hardcore training session, my body is, is not as, I would say, damaged. And I, I'm not talking about like exterior damage. I'm talking about inflammation in my joint. I don't, I don't feel that way. I, I feel like I'm, like, like I would say, uh, to make an analogy, like uh, a car that you do your service on, like I'm well, I'm well lubricated. I'm ready to go again, you know? So Amazing. It makes, it makes you feel good. How much do you weigh right now? Right now, um, I lost, I would say, about if I compare my weight that in the morning when I wake up, I would say I lost about four pounds. I'm about four, four pounds lighter than I normally is. Normally, I used to be one, 184. Now, I'm about one, 180 when I wake up uh, in the morning. But I, I, I'm just as strong, and I'm, I would say... I truly believe that I think the, um, unfortunately, because of COVID, I wanted to go in a scan to, to see the result, but I can't because everything is closed here in Canada. But I, I, I believe that the, the, the weight that I've lost is mostly water retention. Probably connected with the inflammation or something like that, like we were talking about. Now, a lot of people will be familiar with an animal-based diet who are listening to this podcast, but tell us about what you ate over the course of the month. You were I so appreciate you posted pictures of almost every meal. I think every single meal you ate over the last month, you posted a picture yeah. on your Instagram and tagged me and I reposted. So if people were following me on Instagram, they saw your meals, but tell us about what you ate over the past month and, and how it seemed to you to, to be. Um, a lot of people, when I've started that diet told me that it was crazy because, and it, it, to me, if I would not have took the time to read your, your research and, and, and when you what, what you talk about, it would sound crazy to me too because I'm I'm born and raised in, in, with the idea that yeah I grew up on a farm I always eat animal but also there's a lot of veggies and it's a very according I've always been told that oh eat, eat your veggies it's very good and so it's the first time I try something like this so uh, uh, I didn't know what to expect uh, I've I've heard Joe Rogan and a couple of my friends have tried it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what I do basically is I, I try to eat uh, a lot of organs, uh, liver, heart, kidneys, um, trips, uh, include that in my diet. It's something that I normally don't eat because it's not part of our, I would say, most of North American uh, diet. But it's, uh, it's something that when you eat it, it's very nutritive. So I include that, and, and also I try to eat a lot of uh, stuff that comes from an animal, uh, grass-fed uh, animal, uh, free-range, uh, wild-catch fish, uh, on top of it. And if I'm still hungry at the end, I'm eating uh, fruits, uh, mostly berries, uh, sometimes bananas, and, and, but no veggies and no processed food. Um, I, I, the first three weeks, I was very on point I, I i didn't even season at all my my meat i just i put salt but no nothing else like i was really like by the book very disciplined the last week i would say i i, I loosen up a little bit uh because i, I like 
to put spice on it, but I, I was very, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't exaggerate. You know what I mean? I, I was very uh, disciplined. But what I've, what I've, the knowledge I've gained from that uh, diet is that I'm gonna incorporate that to my everyday life. Of course, I'm not gonna be as rigid as I was for the, the first three weeks of that diet, but I'm still gonna incorporate organs, meat. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna eat veggies anymore. I think. I mean, I don't think I. I I'm gonna eat fruit, but I don't think I'm gonna go crazy on veg. I might go eat pasta times two times, eat cakes, chocolate, but I'm gonna definitely be more aware of what I eat. And I think I, 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 um, I'm very happy I've, did, I've, I've done this. You know, I went to one extreme to the other. Now I can put myself in the middle range and, and, and put that in perspective. And find some balance and see what works for you and, and keep track of whether the big toe starts to hurt again. That'll be interesting to keep track of. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I am someone who loves to eat. I'm a, I got addiction to, to sugar, fast food, processed food. It's very bad. Like I, what, what saves me is that perhaps genetics, the fact that I train hard and I do intermittent fasting, but, but I'm aware that now I'm 40 years old. I'm going to be more cautious with stuff that I eat now um, because you might look good on the outside, but inside, you know, I, I was diagnosed with ulcer colitis. Maybe there, there's a problem, you know. So I have to be aware of that. And, and um, the fact that I've tried a diet really uh, opened my eyes and, uh, in, in, into a lot of stuff that I need to take in consideration. You know, I, I can only imagine what might have happened if you'd eaten this way during your MMA career. Because you said that you didn't eat great during your MMA career, right? Do you think this would have helped when you were fighting? It would have helped. Um, it, it would have helped uh, definitely. I, I believe, especially on the longevity of an. I think, I think it could help also in perf on the performance side. But I think, especially on on the longevity of uh, of a career uh, of uh, the life of an individual. That's my my main belief in terms of uh, for MMA. I'm talking about. Um, for sure, uh, you know, when I was fighting, most of my pre-fight meal was, uh, I love pasta. I was eating a bowl of pasta with uh, fettuccine Alfredo. And, and I swear, it's crazy. I, crazy as, as it sounds, it was like my, uh, my thing. Uh, I love pasta because you're never hungry before a, a fight. You kind of force yourself to eat. And I know everybody told me I was crazy, but it was working well for me. Um, I never been someone. I never was someone who really pay attention of what I eat because I was able to get away with it. But uh, it catch up on me at, at at a certain point, and that's why I got uh, diagnosed with ulcer colitis. And now I need to be aware of it, uh, of what I'm eating, and I pay the price for all the stupid thing that I've done in the past. You had an ACL injury in your MMA career, didn't you? I had two ACL injuries. Two, two, my left and my right. Both legs. Wow. If, if I would have known what I've known now, I would have uh, incorporated that diet and also um, intermittent time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting into my, uh, my life a, a long time ago. But the idea of, of eating animal base and especially uh, fasting to me sounds preposterous because I believe we all live in a, in a society that we're bombarded by publicity all the time. Eat this, eat that, protein shake, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't, even if you would have told me that it was good, I would probably not have believed it until I got sick and I, had, I was forced to make a change. You know, I, I uh, that's how crazy it is. Sometimes there's some lesson that can be learned and some lesson that cannot be be, be, be taught. You know, they, they, they need to be lived in order to, to learn. I always wonder when I see athletes having issues with their back or their ligaments, would more protein, more collagen and animal foods have prevented this or have helped? I remember when I was in medical school, I think 
you know, eight or nine years ago, Brock Lesnar was fighting and then he was out with diverticulosis and then diverticulitis. And so many of these athletes in MMA and across all the sports, I just wonder, you know, like how much more longevity and, and how much more safe could these athletes be in terms of their joints and their ligaments, but also their brains in terms of the nutrients that we need to protect the brains yeah. by eating more nutrient rich diets. So I'm excited. I mean, it's so cool that, that you did this, that you were brave enough to try it. And, you know, I don't know, do you know Chito Vera? So he's fighting June 20th. He, he reached out to me as well. He's a one. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The sound, the sound cut. I think you, your, your mic cut. Let me see. Uh, no, no, I got you. I hear okay. you now. Okay. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> The uh, Chito Vera is a 135 uh, guy in the UFC and he saw what you were doing. He reached out to me. So he's eating animal based before his upcoming fight and feeling good. And I'm just excited for more athletes to do it just to help you guys have longer, more successful careers and, and not be, you know, handicapped later on. I think you're one of the um, smart, I think your fight IQ, many would argue that your fight IQ is second to none. And it's incredible that you've <laughs> but you've gone through your career and you can still do all the things you want to do at the end of your MMA career. You know, a lot of these, there are a lot of guys who have done jujitsu or martial arts their life and they, they end up with these incredible achievements and they go to these incredible mental places, but then physically they're handicapped later on. And so how yeah. cool is this? But just to be able to give people the ability to fight longer, to perform in whatever sport they want longer, it's, it's an exciting thing. So I, I posted this post about your photo and I said, what questions should I ask GSP? And of course, everybody wants to know if you're coming back to fighting and if you're going to fight Khabib. And I, I, I've heard you talk about these, but I wanted to ask you on the podcast. Uh, listen, I'm going to explain to you this, this are a, a whole thing that goes on, a, a crazy story that goes on about uh, me fighting Khabib. We tried to make the fight with Khabib. Uh, I think it was two years ago. Uh, and we tried, we, we really tried and the UFC did not want at the time. They, had, they said they had other, other plan for Khabib. Um, then very recently, a fight, a boxing fight with Oscar De La Hoya was proposed to me by Triller. And I'm still under contract with UFC. And I was interested to do it because it was something different. It was supposed to be eight rounds, two minutes the round with bigger gloves. So the risk of injuries are, are much reduced. And, you know, I would never pretend that I think I could have beat Oscar De La Hoya in boxing when he was in his prime. But I think now, because he's older than me, he used to compete at a lighter uh, weight class than I did. And also, maybe I, I, I believe I... I believe he has more mileage than, than I do. For this reason, I think it would have made a, a, fair, a fair fight. And also, he's my second favorite boxer of all time behind Sugar Ray Leonard. So I, I would have been cool at six, maybe at 75 years old. I can look back in my life and, and tell everybody, hey, I, I boxed with Oscar de la Hoya. It would have been fun. That's why I, I wanted to do it. And also on top of that, a big part of the money would have been given to charity just to, because when I had talked to Oscar and, and um, Mr. Khan, I told them that was one of my condition to prove that we don't take ourselves too seriously because we're doing this like, a, I would say like a freak show for entertainment and for fun. We're not doing this to know who's the best in the world. I don't, I, I have no longer the desire to compete to become the best in the world right now. It's, it's done, I'm 40 years old. I think my best year are probably behind me. So when that happened, I needed to have the blessing of Dana White. When I called Dana White, he, he refused, he didn't want it. And I understand why a uh, trailer is a, their comp competitor to UFC. Not competitor in terms of uh, to, to, to find out who's the best fighter because that's not what trailer is about. It's about entertainment. It's about like a freak show. And it's good. It's different form of entertainment. And I'm not one of the guys who's going to hate on the Logan Paul, the, the Paul brothers. I think it's great. It's entertainment. It, there's room for every, everything, I believe. So Dana, Dana White refused. And a few weeks after, because the thing went in the media, he called me back. He said, George, would you like to come back and fight Khabib? It's Dana who called me. It's not me who called Dana. And he caught me in a very special time because I was just finishing my training. And when he called me, I, 
I, I was on the car and, 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 and I, I put him on the Bluetooth and he said, would you like to fight Khabib? I said, man, I said, why did, did why you didn't want to do this two years ago? He said, oh, yeah, Khabib was not who he was and you were, you, he was not retired now. You're both retired. That would make sense. And I told him, I said, I thought it was weird that he changed his mind. So I said to him, I said, I never thought that you would ask me this. So this, this was out of my mind. So l let me think about it because now it's COVID. There's a lot of things I need to consider if I go back into a training camp and I'll get back to you. So I didn't, I didn't talk to him for a few days. And now things came like blow up in the media saying like, oh, George asked to fight Khabib. I did not ask to fight Khabib. I'm good where I am. I'm retired and I have no... If Dana would have not called me and asked me that, I would never not have been excited about that the idea, and and I don't even know, quite frankly, if I if I would have said yes today. No, I don't think I would have said yes. I'm good where I am, uh, you know. It, it's not something now. I don't want. I, I don't have the the desire anymore to compete to be the best in the world. Um, Khabib, however, is different because he's, he's someone that never lost, and I don't know. I don't think I don't. But I don't even think I would have done it right right now. I think it would be all, all over. So that's the, the, the true story about this whole thing. This whole thing that's going on right now. Like people think that I asked for that fight. I did not ask for that fight. Dana is the promoter. He tried to make up fight. And it's not the first time that things happen that way. They're, that, they're promoters. That's what they, they're trying to do. They try to put two guys against each other and make them fight. But I have the highest uh, amount of respect for Khabib. And I think he had the perfect career. He retired with a perfect career. Uh, and um, right now, I don't think I have uh, the desire to go back and fight again. I don't. I do not have the desire to fight again. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. I've heard you talk about it in the past. I mean, it seems like it's a, it's a stressful thing. I mean, I've heard you talk on Lex's podcast about fighting in general and say that fighting is stressful and that you don't necessarily like fighting. It, it seems to me that, that you're a, you're a martial artist, that, that you're a philosopher and that you see it as a path, but. I, I did, I did fought to have this, to have my, my freedom, to have my life, to have the money, to have the access of thing that most people don't have. I, I got this through fighting. That's why I did it. Not because I love to fight. I love training. I love the science of it. But to get into a, a cage with another guy and not knowing if you will be humiliated or badly hurt, it's unbearable for me. It's very hard. And the thing also, because we're in COVID crisis, everything is closed here in Canada. Everything is closed. The gyms are just reopened now today. Like, and, and it's MMA is not even legal. Like there is sport like tennis that you're far away from another person that are legal. So how would you want me to conduct a training camp and fly over? Because if I'm getting ready for a fighting a world champion, I'm, I need to fly over some training partner to try to replicate certain things that he will do to me. And I, it, it would be impossible in those conditions. And however, people ask me, why would you take the Oscar De La Hoya fight? It's much easier in boxing because I would have just just have to go to wild card train with Freddie Roach and Freddie Fred Roach got it all figured out. He got all the training partner and everything. In boxing, it's 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 more much more easy to do. Uh, but in MMA, I would need to to you know I would need to organize that I, and it's illegal here. I would I don't know I would have done it. I would have to go somewhere else to do my training camp. So it, all this would have caused incredible problems to me and. Um, that's why I wanted to do more the, the, the Laoya thing, because that was something that I, I never did before. And that's why it excites me. That to, and and to, fight, to, to fight at the world-class level and to be the best in the world in, in MMA, I've done it all my life and it's done. I, I, I have no longer the, the desire to do this. Yeah. If, you, if there had been an example, if there had been a moment where you were going to fight Khabib, we can talk about the strategy now. Like, how do you think you would have solved that riddle? There's only one way to find out. And I can tell you, tell you I don't know. I, I, I think Khabib is very good. He's a very good wrestler when he got his opponent against the fence. And I think I should have tried to avoid the fight when I got my back against the fence. 
trying to take the center, use a lot of my footwork movement in and out and reaction and, and uh, reaction and proactive takedown from the outside. Like, like I'm very good with and, and uh, my creativity, my, my, my rhythm and, and everything. I think that's what have, that would have been my, my main goal. If I would have taken the fight, try to make the fight more in the center of the octagon, take the center and not trying to make it in a way that I got, I got stuck with my back against the fence in a clinch position because that's where it's very strong. I'm very strong in the open, in the middle. So I think that the, 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 first, the fighter that, will be, that would have been able to control where the fight would have take place would have more odds to win. Your, your takedowns are something that are very unique. Um, the way that you fought J you know, Johnny Hendricks, I remember watching that fight and he threw a punch in the first round, I think in the first 20 seconds. Yeah. He, as soon, yeah. As soon as he threw the punch, you were in there for a tanked out. It was like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I, I've done that to pretty much everybody that I've fought because for me, I use reactive and proactive takedown. Proactive is when I initiate, I, I'm giving them a bait and a distraction to get into their legs to put them down. And the, this is the proactive and the reactive is when I'm making them throw a punch and then I'm sliding underneath them. Uh, they both both very work very well for me and they're very economical uh, ways of putting their opponent down. Uh, when I, if you compare, for example, my style to uh, Khabib or Kamaru Usman, there are guys that mo most of the time they like to put their opponent, their back against the fence, and from there, work their takedowns, to, to grind their takedowns, which work great for them. But for me, because I don't come from a, a, a wrestling background, I use my karate, my movement in and out to, to create my takedown opportunities. So my takedowns are good, not only because of my, my wrestling, I would say because of my timing that I got from karate. And I heard you say that on Lex's podcast. I thought it was so fascinating. It, how much of MMA do you think comes down to timing? And, and how hard is that to learn? Uh, timing, it's something that it comes from repetition and repetition and repetition. And the way you can improve your timing is, of course, by drilling and also, also by having a different range of training partner. So you're used to fight a guy who's shorter, more stocky, uh, a guy who's longer with a, with a big reach because everybody moves in a different way. Of course, there's the, the reaction time that comes into play, the, the decision-making time, but I believe MMA, it's a little bit like tennis. They know now that tennis, it's the body language that makes someone catch the ball in, in, when there's the first serve because the ball come at, at a very, like a crazy speed that you're, you don't have, there is no human, human that has a good enough reaction time to, to catch the ball. It's the same thing in fighting. There is no human that can catch a punch or something. It, the, the reason why they, they are able to avoid it or, or, or to deal with it, it's because of the body language, because they're used to see it in training so they can identify certain pattern and know in advance what is coming. Is it a punch? Is it a kick? Oh, he's coming with a big left hook. Then I'm going to duck under be before it comes. So you, you recognize certain patterns that you have identified and, and learned through training and drilling that makes you have a, a, like an head start on your opponent. But this comes with a lot of work. How did you get started in martial arts? You have a story of your childhood, right? I, uh, I start martial art because of, uh, I started as, as, as a self-defense. Uh, I was victim of bullying growing up in a school. And uh, I always was a big fan of Jean-Claude Van Damme, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Steven Seagal, Chuck Norris. So, uh, I wanted to learn karate to defend myself. And my dad was a black belt in karate. He started to teach me at a very young age, around eight years old. But he was working too much. And I, so he put me in a school 
Uh, and uh, at the time, I, uh, I remember my karate teacher was very hardcore. Uh, the way he was teaching, it would not have been possible to teach the, the same way today because he would probably end up in jail. <laughs> but that's what I needed at the time because I grew up with a lot of anger and I needed discipline. And uh, that's what I've learned from uh, karate. And then after... Karate starts as a self-defense. It became a passion because it was ultimately the place where I was feeling at I was feeling at my best because I was very successful. I was collecting medals. So I was it, it was it was making me feel great. And the the self-defense became a passion, and then the, the passion became a, a business. When I first saw the 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 UFC. Royce Gracie winning the, the first tournament in the Ultimate Fighting Championship and it really inspired me. And I knew at the time I was like, man, that's what I want to do for a living. Everybody thought I was crazy, but I, uh, I worked really hard and I made the sacrifice and uh, there we go. I, I succeeded. You did. You did, my friend. That is an understatement. Um, now, it seems to me that you are a philosopher also, that this is something bigger for you than just fighting, that there is a, that you're on a path of self-improvement or like self-examination, right? I mean, isn't that what martial arts are really? And is, is there a bigger theme here for you, some self-exploration throughout all of these processes? I, I, I think when you say mar, mixed martial art, martial art, people are like, why the word heart? I think the, the artistic expression comes from the fact that, to me, the ultimate goal in a fight outside of winning, winning is the priority, it's also to showcase a beautiful technique with a beautiful timing and execution. So beautiful that even someone who doesn't know nothing about martial art would look at would look at the sequence and be like, "Wow, that was beautiful." Same way, for example, that you watch uh, uh, LeBron James in, in basketball or Stephen Curry. You know, just even though you don't know nothing about basketball, you watch them play, and you know there is something different about them because the way they they move, it's beautiful. And it's the same thing. I think it's the ultimate goal as an athlete outside of winning is to, to showcase something beautiful. And that's when the artistic part of martial art comes into play. It's almost like a dance, right? And it's, yeah. it's meant to be beautiful. And, you know, when I used to run long distances, I wanted to be beautiful in my stride. Ultimately, I'm glad I don't run long distances anymore because it was hard on my body. But it's the <laughs> same thing with surfing as I'm trying to learn to surf. And I've dabbled in jujitsu as well. And it's just, it, I understand exactly what you mean. And I hope that even listeners who haven't done these things will understand that. Like, it's, it's, it's the way you do the movements. It just feels beautiful. And it's ultimately, it's a pursuit of beauty, isn't it? Yes, exactly. You, you, you want that ultimately even someone who doesn't know anything about that sport watch you and be like man this is that that was beautiful that's the ultimate goal and for me as an athlete i've started my career when the sport was not very well accepted we were not on the same level as um, i would say a baseball player hockey player in canada or basketball player we were more like uh, Per, pursue as a barbarian, so to speak. There is even an article in the, in the newspaper in Canada when I when I fought when when the UFC first come in Canada, first came in Canada. I, I fought and beat Matt Serra. There's an article in the in in the newspaper that I still have. You see me on on the cover page like this on top of Matt Serra, and it's written, "The barbarian overthrown the Montreal Canadian for the record of assistance because ice hockey is our national sport in Canada." And we beat the record of the uh, for the crowd, the biggest crowd ever. So I, I kept that article, and now things has changed since then because these same guys that are saying that I'm a barbarian now they're the one who calling me, calling me for interviews. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good because it comes from it. It, 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 it has to go through the 
they, to be accepted, a sport need to be need to go through uh, education. People need to be educated on the matter. Because I can understand why people they see pe someone getting hit on the on the ground, they don't know what's going on. They they think it's violent, and it is violent, and it's not a form of entertainment that is made for everybody, like boxing, football, or, or you know any other sport. Everybody like their own thing. But one thing I can tell you for sure, for certain, is that fighting it's is ingrained in every one of us. And if you do not believe me, think about this. You can take anybody, the nicest person you know, and put that person in a situation that he would need to fight either to survive or to protect someone that he loves. My mom, who's probably the nicest person I know, if I would have put her in a situation that the life of of uh, her children was uh, threatening threat, she would have fought to protect us, even though she doesn't know how to fight, but she would have done it. And even when you go watch a baseball game or a basketball game, if there is a fight that breaks out in the stand, you'll stop watching the game and you'll watch the fight because it's threatening you. It's something that we, we, we all recognize a pattern. And this is not something we can say about baseball, basketball, All sport, I believe, it's our modern ways of making war. Now we don't go on the battlefield and kill each other. We, we, we play games. My, my team against your team, it's competition. You know what I mean? That's our ways of making war. But we don't, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't kill ourselves. So fighting is really someone, it, it's really something that I believe everybody can relate to. Because we, we can all ourselves be in a situation that we're going to have to fight in our, either to survive or if it's not us, it's our ancestors have done it. I completely agree with you. I mean, when I'm out surfing in the lineup, thankfully it doesn't happen that often, but sometimes people get into arguments with each other and they'll start yelling at each other and everyone's head turns. It's just, it's, it's hardwired into us. We can't not watch a fight because yeah. it, it's such a part of who we are. And that's not a bad thing. It's just who we are. And I think that more and more people should train self-defense just because it's part of who we are as humans. And certainly when I went to medical school, uh, I was in my first year of medical school and my roommate and I put on boxing gloves and we were just playing around. I don't think either of us knew how to throw a punch. And he hit me square in the nose and I ended up with like a black eye and I felt so embarrassed that I went to the, the phone book and I was like, where is jujitsu? Because this guy's a wrestler and I'm gonna need to learn jujitsu because I'm gonna beat him. And I did, that was the impetus. And I went and I learned jujitsu and it was the, one of the hardest things I've ever done for two years. I broke my hand, I broke ribs, but it was so valuable to do it. Um, and I'm so glad that I trained jujitsu and then subsequently a little bit of Muay Thai, but I, I want to find more of it in Costa Rica, but I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's built into who we are. It's not a bad thing. It's something for us to harness and use in a beautiful way. Now, for, yeah. Yeah, for, for, me, for me personally, I, I, I train not because I, I tell you the truth. I don't think I, I might get into a fight or anything like this or my life will be threatening. I, I, don't, I never know. You never know. But I train more because it's a therapy for me. Also, the fact that maybe because I was bullied when I was young, it's, it left a scar in my mind that, yeah, I tell you the truth, that's how crazy I am. When I, when I have an injury, like I had a sciatic nerve injury a few, like a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I had even an issues to, 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 to stand up straight. I didn't feel very confident. Like it's a, it's a, I know it's stupid. It sounds stupid, but maybe because of my past and the fact that I'm training martial art, I like to walk in a room and be confident that if anything happened, I'm, I'm, I can take care of business. You know what I mean? The chance that it happened are incredibly low, but for me, it's a therapy. It's a confidence thing. And I believe in life, if you have all the skills in the world at doing something, but you do not have the confidence, it's a little bit like someone who has a lot of money in his bank account, but no way of accessing it. I think if you want to be good at something and doesn't have to be in a sport in anything, You need the skills, the knowledge, but you need also the confidence. If you don't have the confidence, you're going nowhere. You know, you need both in order for the magic to happen and to be successful. What advice would you give to a younger George? 
or to somebody who wants to train MMA or something? Well, a younger George, I would say, I was very often overthinking too much and putting a lot of stress on myself, which maybe was a good thing because I knew that that's how I perform at my best when I'm on the edge. You know, if I take one step back, I'm going to fall off. But at one point it became crazy, you know, like an obsession. I would probably tell, told myself, hey, try to relax a little bit more and try to enjoy the process because, you know, you're not going to do that for the rest of, for, for the rest of your life. It's only a, a window in your life that you're going to do this. So enjoy it as much as you can. And I think I, I spend too much time stress, stressing about the outcome instead of focusing about enjoying the process. And uh, for someone who start martial art, I got that a lot. And, and it's probably going to disappoint a lot of people. I got a lot of parents that comes with their kids and they, they, they told me, say, George, this is my son. He's the future world champion. Which advice do you have for him? I look at him and I tell him, I said, man, you're going at school? How's school? He's like, I'm good. And I, I'm telling him like, that should be your priority. That's what is the most important thing. Your brain, be educated, you know? And the parent, very often when I say that to their kid, they look at me like this. And I'm thinking, I'm like, it's not because I made it that I'm going to tell your kid to choose the same path. It's a, it's a very hard path that is not made for everybody. And if you look at the odds, the chance of success are very low. Only one on maybe 100,000 made it. And I'm saying made it. I'm talking about a guy who can retire and have enough money for, to live good for the rest of his life with health, with his health. It's not given to, a, to everybody this. I know the reality. It's a nightmare. So when I tell a kid this, I say, be at school. Yeah, train if you want. Try to make it, you know. And it's, this is the same thing in baseball, hockey, basketball. Because the problem with, with professional sport, if you give up school and education and you put all your eggs in the same basket, then you, you try to make it. Perhaps you're going to go far, but let's say you fail. And there's a big chance that you will, unfortunately, if you look at the odds. And sometimes it could be related to something different, not because you're not you're not you're not good enough it could be because you get in a car accident you break your hips and it's finished your career is done but if that happened and, and if you're 30 or years old or 28 years old or you know in, in your early 30s it's too late there's nothing that you can fall back into if you don't have an assurance in life so what i say to the young people i'm telling them be at school be educated it's like an assurance if, if your first choice of career doesn't work, at least you have something else that you can fall back into. And that's what I did. I had a, I had a choice in my life. I went to school. But like every other kids, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I changed all the time. I was studying at one point in aeronautic, aeronautics, an airplane. Then the tower collapsed. The, the market went down. I changed. I was in kinesiology. Then I... I I didn't know where I was, where I, what I wanted to do, but it's normal if you don't know what you want to do as a carer. And it's normal because you're not the same person at, at 20 that you are, that you were at 15 and you won't be the same one at 25 and 30. Your priority, your, your life will change and it will make you a different person in a way, but stay there, educate yourself. I think it will open doors for you. And, and sooner or later in your life, an opportunity will come and you'll find out what you really wanted to do for a living. But don't put all your eggs in the same basket because it's a very big risk and it's not worth it. Now, you posted something on your social media about Star Wars and I thought, George is a Star Wars fan. I think you said you care about three things and I forget, like MMA or fighting, Star Wars and something else. Like, Tell me about Star Wars, George. Like, I love Star Wars, too. I'm a child of this, the 80s. You know, I'm 43, so I'm just a few years older than you. And, um, you know, I grew up watching Star Wars with my dad. But you're a big Star Wars fan then. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I even watched the, the cartoon. I watch every, <laughs> everything that there is to watch about Star Wars. And I grew, I grew up with Star Wars. I'm a, 
I'm 40 years old, so I grew up watching the episode uh, uh, four, five, six. Then the the, the prequel came. Then I, I watched just the the sequel. Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't like the sequel as much as the the original three trilogy and the prequel one. I think they, and perhaps the reason why I think it, they did not have as much success is because they made every movie um with the like they didn't make the trilogy they didn't they didn't they didn't have any plan for the trilogy the sequel they made every movie by itself and every time every movie when it was different pro producer they, they kind of mess up the story and it was i thought it was sad because it was such it's a great product and they kind of mess it up at the end and it was frustrating but uh, now i think they they're working on patching it up and and uh to 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 with the new uh, show the the Mandalorian and uh, the book of Boba Fett and the Bad Batch they try to 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 catch up and ma make it make it look better. It's an incredible universe, and I love this post that you had on Instagram. Anakin Skywalker would have been the most powerful force uh, of the entire Star Wars universe. He never got to reach his full potential. The same thing as everything in life: skills without hard work is a waste. So. I love that post about Anakin, man. You were just Anakin didn't didn't realize his full potential. Well, you know what, uh, Paul? Th th there's a lot of people like that in life, and I'm sure there is in every field in me in medicine, uh, in, in in MMA, in football, in soccer, in hockey. How many guys do you know that were so crazy talented, but they made bad choices in life, or they did something stupid and they ruined their career? I've seen it a lot, you know, unfortunately, I can't, I can't disclose the name of, but I've seen a few guys that perhaps were, were, were way more talented than I am, but I made it and they didn't because they made bad choices or maybe they didn't work hard, worked hard enough. Or perhaps there's other, I believe there's always a cause, but we don't always understand the cause, but it's frustrating, you know, when you think about it. It's, it's really a tragedy. The other thing you said you care about is aliens. And I, we have to talk about aliens. Yeah. Do you, th do you think there's extraterrestrial life out there? Do you think there's aliens in the universe? Man, I think it would be, we don't have any evidence of it, but I think the universe is so big, man. It might, it might, it might be. And now we know more, we know, Every year, we, they, they found a planet in Goldilocks zone. So now that the, the chance that we find life during our, our, our we discover life in, on another planet in our lifetime are increasing. Because, you know, I, I, I'm not saying intelligent life, but maybe we'll find life or, or evidence that there were life in other planet before. So they talk about Mars and, and, you know, it's interesting to contemplate the, the idea that maybe at one point it, it was life. And, and the whole idea of how life began on, on Earth, on, on this planet, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of paleontology. The, there's a theory called panspermia. It's the, that life comes from somewhere else, perhaps a, a, an asteroid or a, a meteorite have collided with the planet and brought life in a, in a, in a microscopic uh, form and that's how everything started. I don't think in, in science we, we, we learned that nothing comes from nothing. That there is always something. And I cannot conceive a beginning to tell you the truth. We talk about the Big Bang and everything, but it doesn't mean it comes from nothing. It always comes from something, but we're not smart and educated enough to know where it comes from. So I don't know. I just don't know. I like to contemplate the idea that, yes, hopefully there is life. And, and perhaps what I personally believe is it's all our salvation is to be able to get out of, of the planet that we live on. Because if you, if you know the, the history, you know that we're bombarded by asteroid and comet every couple thousand years. Like the last one, the last big one was uh, 12,000 years ago, approximately the last of the Pleistocene era. And there was one in uh, Tunguska, I think the, in 1908, 
it hit on on the on, in a region where they, they, nobody lives. But if it would have lit, hit in New York City, you can be sure that all the world leader would would spend a lot more money looking at the sky than uh, build try to build up a weapon of mass destruction. And I think uh, we, we should pay attention to 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 the sky and, and things that happen in our environment, like like super volcano or Yellowstone and all that. Because this can cause mass mass uh, extinction. So I think our, our salvation as a species is to get out and find a way to be able to colonize other planet, perhaps. It's, it, otherwise, we will perish like the dinosaurs sooner or later if we stay here. Do you, would you live on Mars if Elon was able to terraform Mars? Would you go to Mars? <laughs> and I, I, think, I think it will happen, but... I, I believe it, it will happen not in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. It will happen then, much later, I believe. And what about all these reports coming out of these, quote, UFOs or unidentified aerial vehicles? What, what do you think are, are unidentified aerial objects? Like, what do you think about all these things? You know, Donald Fravor and... They, yeah. they changed the, the word now for UAP, uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Because unidentified flying object, it means it's an object. It's something that perhaps is solid, but aerial phenomenon, it doesn't mean anything. So it's less uh, woo-woo, I would say. So, but it's kind of weird what happened now because there is very credible witness that talks about it. And, and they, they, you know, in science, when they, 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 the way they describe it, it's been picked up by radar. It makes you wonder, is it really something that comes from another dimension, another world, or it is something that comes from our adversary or another nation that are able to perhaps trick our radar or our system? But even though if, if it tricks our radar, there is eyes, very credible high witnesses that have seen these things. So I don't know what to make of it. But I think it would need more investigation in, in order to have an answer. I think, it, I, I believe it's a mistake to right away saying, oh, these are alien or, or ghosts or demon or God or whatever. You know, I, I think you need evidence. Uh, incredible claim uh, needs incredible evidence, like Carl Sagan says. Well, hopefully the Pentagon will release some of this stuff in the next few weeks. I think they're planning to. Um, you mentioned I think they will yeah. release, but I would be very surprised if they release everything they know. Uh, perhaps imagine because we're ultimately we're always in competition with one another. We're USA, US, United States are the, the most powerful country in the world right now. But every nation, if you look at history, Rome's, the Greek, sooner or later it collapsed and there's another one that will take over, you know. So I think it. it if you lay down all your card on the table, everybody will see it. You know what I mean? And, and, and I don't know. I mean, it's sad, but I believe it's it should not be seen as a threat. And, and, and it would it would need in, in order for some a big leap in, in that area. I think it would it would need to be a collective effort with all the government all together putting their card on the table. I don't think the U.S. will do it. If Russia and and China does not do it, it would be illogical because if they do that, that's mean they 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 leave everything open to 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 know how ignorant we are as as a nation, you know, so so to speak. So I don't think they will do it. I, I mean, I would be very surprised. They perhaps say, yeah, we 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 know there's things that are flying in our sky that we don't know what it is, but I don't think they will give away all their. Uh, all the result of, of their investigation. I would be very surprised. It's, it's crazy to think about how much is classified that we don't know about, all the secrets. What is out there? Who knows? I, I, I wonder, I wonder, is, is it someone that knows or, 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 or we don't know. Is, is there a human being that knows the truth or, or there is not? I mean, there, there is, a, I don't know if, uh, if there is actually someone who knows or, 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 or who doesn't. Yeah. You mentioned paleoanthropology and that you're interested in this. And I've heard you talk about the fact that you visited the Maasai in the past. And I wanted to ask you about this. When did you visit the Maasai and what did you see? Like, what, what were they like? Because 
you know, I was just in Africa spending time with the Hadza who are the neighbors of the Maasai. So I'm also fascinated by these, these cultures. Yeah, I, I went to uh, Maasai Mara to do a safari because I, um, uh, I wanted to, to, to have a crazy experience to, to look at the animals and, and, uh, and, and their uh, natural environment. And I think it's sad sometimes when you watch an animal that is captive, you know, in captivity. But sometimes it's for the best because they, they, their parents were in captivity, so they have no choice because if they're, they put it in the wall, it's going to die. So, um, but I wanted to have a chance to see wildlife in, 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 in their, their, their natural habitat. And uh, when I visited the Maasai, they, they were exclusively 99, I think they were 99% carnivore. And they eat some roots sometimes, but they, I thought it was fascinating. And they look great. They're beautiful people. They're, 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 they're tall. I mean, and I asked a question if some of them are, are sick and what is the main cause of mortality? The main cause of mortality, they, they explained to me, that, is that the fact that the, the, the hospital, the closest hospital is miles and miles away from them. So when someone gets sick or anything bad happened they, they, or an infection, they... they they're doomed, so to speak. You know what I mean? They don't have access directly to technology like we have in modern society in, in our cities. But I thought it was uh, fascinating. And that's why one of, that's one, another reason why I decided to do the, the animal-based diet trial. It's so cool. You know, when I was with the Hadza, the, the major cause of death was falling out of trees. <laughs> that's yeah. The, could. The, their, their main, I think that, I mean, maybe that, I think that that was the statistic, like the main thing that kills the Hadza is they fall out of trees because yeah. they were, they were making steps and, and, you know, almost these, these pitons made out of, uh, made out of sticks and, and branches to climb the baobab trees. And they were going, you know, 30, 40 feet up in the baobab tree. And it was just fascinating to see, but, and that's, that's the reason that I thought that this would be a reasonable diet for humans because, the Hadza eat a lot of fruit and they eat a lot of meat and they eat honey. And it seems to make sense to me. They don't eat a lot of vegetables and the Maasai certainly are another example of that. Yeah. They, they also, I thought that, that there would be concern about the lion and the leopard, but uh, they're absolutely not. They're more concerned about the, the hip, hippos and the rhinoc rhinoceros. So yeah. that's interesting. And snakes. So, so George, uh, you know, Amazing MMA career, widely considered to be the greatest of all time. Certainly in the discussion, you know, uh, you were in some movies and stuff. What's next for you, man? Uh, I'm, I'm involved in fitness uh, a lot. Uh, you know, I have a equipment, uh, Hydro, Hydro Revolution, I'm uh, promoting. Uh, also, uh, True Connect TV .fit. It's a platform that uh, I promote that is there to help people, not only on fitness, but there's program for mental health, uh, also um, yoga. Uh, my program is called a program strike. It's I teach people uh, how to fight and keep them in shape in the same in the same time. But there's things for everybody. Um, and, and I'm doing a lot of, uh, I have a few big projects right now that are coming and in, that involve uh, acting. And I'm working a lot on my uh, acting skills now. It's been two weeks, uh, two weeks, two years that I'm uh, focusing a lot on it. I did some gig in the past, but I was too busy with my mixed martial art career. Uh, the most recent one that I've done, it's uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the series. I was playing a, a mercenary called Batraka, a villain in the series. And uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm, I'm taking this seriously. I have a lot of time and my time, I, I use it to to in, 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 uh, improve my acting skills. Because I think that people like, like you, you know, you're always curious and I'm just so interested, you know, like what is, what is interesting for you now? Like what's the next step on the path? What are you pursuing and acting, anything else? What else is interesting to you now? Like what's fascinating for George these days? Uh, I like to read about paleontology. I went on different uh, sites in Patagonia. I went to uh, uh, Alberta, different places. And I'm planning to go probably, probably in your. Uh, I wanted to go to um, Maurit Mauritania uh, and also Morocco, Egypt. Uh, th these are, they have many sites there that are uh, very fascinating to me uh, in terms of paleontology, uh, archaeology. 
There's one also uh, in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe Karahan. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm very fascinated about these kinds of stuff and, and perhaps a uh, lost civilization that, 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 that we don't know what happened and they vanish. And uh, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's amazing stuff. Go back, let's happy. The work of Graham Hancock is so interesting. And yeah. he, he's talked about these asteroids, the younger dry ass asteroid or whatever happened 12 to 13,000 years ago. It's crazy stuff. Hopefully I'll be able to get him on the podcast too. So uh, yes. George, George it, how come you never had, had hair like this when you were fighting? It looks good, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it, takes long. it takes too long to grow. That's a problem. <laughs> So I don't, I didn't have the patience to wait, but now because of COVID, I did, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody joked on my feed. They said, oh, an animal-based diet, he grew his hair. And I think when you were on Joe Rogan, they were like, oh my God, George St. Pierre has hair. It's funny. George St. Pierre, yes. <laughs> yes, hair. Well, thank you, man. It's been a real honor and pleasure to work with you over the last month. It's so cool to see that you've benefited from this. I really hope that that you sharing your story and sharing about it on your social media will just you know, affect thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives positively and help people understand that there's other options for eating. And I, I hope that, that you'll keep posting about your meals and that you'll keep sharing with people, you know, as your diet morphs back into something a little more in the middle, but it's so cool to hear that you're going to keep organs and animal foods in your diet. And you'll have oh, to yeah. let me know how your diet I, I, evolves I, moving forward. I, I will probably add like chocolate dessert. Uh, I might eat pasta times two times, uh, maybe drink coffee, you know, because I, you know, I like, to live my life fully, full, 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 to the fullest, but I will definitely uh, pay attention more of what I'm eating, and I, I've learned a lot through that experience, and I'm gonna keep a lot of it, a lot of these good habits uh, for the rest of my life. Did you were you able to stop coffee the whole month? Because that is the hardest thing. When yeah. I recommended. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. So. It it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard now. I'm drinking Bombra, but I like coffee. I know it's bad, but I like it in a way that the awareness that it creates, that, that I, that it gives me, I, I feel like it, I don't know what to say. It's like, it makes me more aware, like, but I, in the same time, it's not good. If I take it, it perhaps it, 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 it reduce my ability of falling asleep at night and, and my, uh, um, it, it creates problems of, of, uh, for sleeping, you know? So what's going to be your, I think you're going to stop. You're going to like maybe add some new things in tomorrow. What are you going to eat tomorrow on June the 1st? Oh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to eat my eggs, my bacon. Uh, maybe I like to take the, the yolk of my, of my eggs. I like to, I, I dip my bacon in it, but sometimes there is left instead of licking the plate or I would pre perhaps take a piece of bread and eat it, you know? <laughs> but I won't do, I won't get back. I will not get back to how bad I was in the past. I will, I will, I will shift, but more in the middle. I, I will continue to have chocolate and stuff, but I won't eat as much as I used to because it was crazy. Like you, you would have seen what I was eating before it was bad. Like I, I used to finish a box of chocolate by myself. It's bad. When you start, you're like this and it's uh, it's crazy. And the more you eat, the more you want. And uh, I don't want to get back into this. And the next birthday party you're at, when they have a My Little Pony cake, you can have a piece, George. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> Thank you for so much for coming on the podcast, brother. Yeah, man, we'll, we'll, we'll get together one day, go to the uh, Churrascaria and, uh, and have some fun. I can't wait. I can't wait.